The rest of us, if we could please turn in our Bibles to John chapter 16. John chapter 16, verse 33. This is uh, the conclusion of Jesus' farewell discourse. He goes from here in chapter 16, verse 33, to his high priestly prayer. And from his high priestly prayer, he goes then to his betrayal. John doesn't give it in his gospel, but the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, indicate that Jesus spent significant time praying in Gethsemane. This high priestly prayer is on their way as they cross the Kidron Valley. And as we enter into this season, uh, anticipating Easter, anticipating the joy of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is good and right for us to think, to pause, and to ponder the suffering of Jesus Christ for us. And indeed, here we see how Jesus' love is expressed as he concludes this discourse and enters into prayer. And so let us go to pray before we look at this, this particular verse. Oh Lord, we thank you for the truths of your word. We ask that you would apply them to our hearts and to our lives. For your word, which was spoken, yes, long ago, is indeed relevant to us here and now. For your word is inspired, it is true, it is without error. And these are the words of Christ himself to his disciples. And we are your disciples. We are your people. So speak to us, please. Allow the distractions of our lives to be set aside for a moment. We may feel frazzled or at our wits end. May we please, by your help, be attentive to your word this morning. We may be irritated at a number of different things in our own lives or in the world. Please let us look to Jesus and focus on him and listen carefully to him. And we do ask, O oh Lord, that the Holy Spirit would illumine our hearts and minds and change our wills and desires, that our affections might be more for you and less for the things of this world which are passing. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, verse 33, says, I have told you these things so that... Do you hear the purpose statement? I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So Jesus ends his discourse and proceeds then on the way as they cross the Kidron Valley to pray. This great high priestly prayer in the depths of Christ's love is evident in how he addresses his Father, not only for himself, but particularly in his prayer for his disciples. And not only the disciples that are there, but the disciples that will follow. He prays for you. He prays for me. He prays for us in this high priestly prayer. He doesn't forget his own. He is the good shepherd who is about to lay down his life for the sheep. I have told you these things. Well, what things? Before we get to the what things, I want you to ask this question of yourself and keep it in mind as we go through this single verse. How do you view life? How do you view your life here and now? This time, this place, your circumstances, your relationship, your trials, your joys. Do you view these things from the perspective of Jesus' triumph? Or do you view these things from the perspective of your own strength? From the perspective of your own, perhaps, inadequacy or weakness? from the perspective of living in one particular culture or under one particular government only? Or is that just a part of how you view life? 
We must, as, as Christ's disciples, understand how this verse itself, along with the rest of Scripture, encourages us, indeed commands us, to view life differently. To view life from God's perspective, according to what He has said, according to what He has done for us. And so, as we come to this, we, say, we see that Jesus has told them these things. What are these things? His purpose is that these things will have helped them, His disciples. Well, these things are found especially in chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16. What is known as the Upper Room Discourse, beginning as we mentioned, have mentioned for the last couple of weeks with Jesus ungirding himself, pulling a towel around his waist and washing his disciples' feet, teaching them through his actions how they should love one another and then commanding them to love one another as he has loved them. He gives them commands for them to obey. He gives them promises as we saw last week in chapter 14, 14 of another counselor that will be given to them. The gift of the Holy Spirit who will come and teach them and, and comfort them and counsel them and make his home with us, with them. Jesus says many other things that are good for us to hear and know. And we need to be in God's Word in order to know them. We can't just simply listen to a, 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 a message, even if it's 30 to 40 minutes long. We're not going to know the depths and riches of Scripture unless we get into it on a daily basis in our own lives. I have told you these things. So maybe the very first point of application comes right here. Before we unpack what these things are anymore, the first point of application is to go read these chapters yourself. I'm not going to do all the work for you. You pick up your Bibles. Read John 13 through 16 and see what God has said. Jesus told them these things, though, not just to give them information, but to give them peace. This is the beauty of what Christ's teaching is. It's for our good because it leads us to God, reconciled through Christ's sacrifice that we can come and learn and know how to live and be able to live because of the power of the Holy Spirit within us. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In me. You may have peace. Now, Jesus, remember the context. Remember what's going on. Remember where he's going. Jesus is going to Gethsemane. He's going to Golgotha. He's going to his death. And yet his concern is for his own. His concern is for his friends. His concern is for his disciples. He says to them, in me you may have peace. And that New Testament word we know and, and we should know anyway that it corresponds to the Old Testament word shalom. Peace, Jesus says in John 14, 27, I give you not the kind of peace that the world gives do I give, but I give you my peace. What kind of peace is this? It's more than just the absence of conflict. But it is that. But where's the conflict that is now absent because of Christ? Do you know, do you realize that you are enemies of God outside of Christ? Do you understand that in your own selves you are shaking your fist at heaven and spurning the Lord who made you? Do you know that your own sinful heart has turned away from Him and desires to save yourself? and get the reward that you want? This is who all of us are outside of Christ. This is who each and every person is since Adam and Eve's sin, first sin. We were conceived in sin. That doesn't mean that conception is sinful. It means that we naturally are sinners. We don't sin because of merely outside influences. It's not just because the teacher made me do it. Oh, wait, no, that's the devil made me do it. It's not just that. We sin, we don't do our homework, we cheat on our test because we're sinners. This is who we are outside of Christ. But in Christ, we have an absence of conflict with God 
because He has reconciled us. He has taken the punishment that our own sins deserve upon Himself on the cross. And He has said, Come to Me, believe in Me, repent of your sins, and you will have eternal life. And part of the gift of eternal life is peace with God because of the justification we have through faith in Christ. Peace now with God, our Creator. Peace now with God, who we call our Heavenly Father. So this peace is indeed the absence of conflict, but it's a conflict that is uh, vertical, not just horizontal. This shalom, however, has a broader meaning, a richer, deeper meaning. In addition to that beauty, that glory of peace with God, it means a well-being and a wholeness in our own lives. An understanding now of what we were created to do, of who we were created to be. This wholeness means a reorientation of life. Because now we serve not ourselves, we don't work hard to build our own kingdoms, but we serve the living Savior, we serve the living God. We're at His disposal, we have His resources at our disposal. We are worshiping Him in spirit and in truth, not just for a little while on Sunday morning in a church building, but every day of our lives because we are offering ourselves to Him as living sacrifices. And this or reorientation is a beautiful thing because outside of Christ we live in an upside-down world. And we live backward lives. We live for ourselves. We live to satisfy our own imaginations. We fall in love and serve wrong things, even if they're good things. I don't know if you've ever met a spoiled child. I don't think we have any here in our church. Praise the Lord! <laughs> but a spoiled child is being idolatra... Idol... Idol... I'm gonna... <laughs> is an idol for their parent. Right? Isn't there, this putting a good thing in a place of it being an ultimate thing? And it doesn't work. It doesn't work for the kid. It doesn't work for the family. And it certainly doesn't work for the community. But when we are reoriented because of this peace that we have in Christ, our lives begin to make sense. And we begin to be able to look outside of ourselves for purpose, for meaning, for peace. This kind of shalom, this wholeness and well-being is a peace with God and a peace within ourselves because we can finally have freedom from our guilt. We can have clean consciences. And I'm sure you, like myself, have struggled through a nagging conscience, through a guilty conscience where we just can't get, we can't shake that sense that we know we've done something wrong until we repent and come to Christ. And Christ offers that because of His work for us on our behalf on the cross. And so in Him we may have peace. Peace with God, peace with ourselves, within ourselves, and peace also then with others. Because in this world we will have trouble. Trouble not just in the big bad things, but trouble interpersonally as well. But it's only in Christ that we have this. So if you mark your Bibles or if you're taking sermon notes, circle, highlight, write down, in me. Because many things in our culture promise peace. Peace, peace, but there is no peace. We think if we have a different job, we'll get peace. If we have a different house, we'll get peace. If we had different family members, we'd have peace. If we had more money, we have peace, or if not peace, then something, which is better than nothing, our world tells us. But it's only in Christ, in Christ, that we have this peace. So how do we stay in Him? Turn back in your Bibles just very quickly to chapter 15. This is why you need to take up your Bibles and, and study God's Word yourselves. Chapter 15 gives us how we can remain in Christ because Jesus isn't here speaking only of coming to Him in salvation, for salvation, of that initial conversion experience, of that initial 
personal repentance and faith where we say, I'm sorry for my sins. I know that I've offended a holy God and I believe that Jesus is my Savior. He died for me. It's not talking only of that initial conversion. It's talking about a continuing union with Christ by faith. Look just at what Jesus says, the picture he paints for us. I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You get the picture. He's talking to a culture where there were vineyards all around. It made sense to these people. They would know what he's talking about. About. You're not going to get grapes just by hanging up a bunch from the grocery store on your kitchen counter. They're not going to multiply. In fact, if you leave them there long enough, I think they turn into raisins. Not sure. Maybe I just haven't left our grapes out long enough, but they're not grapes that are fit for eating anymore as grapes because they're cut off from the branch. You are already clean, Jesus says to his disciples, verse 3, because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. Did you hear that? Jesus says, remain in me, abide in me, settle yourself in me, maintain that constant communion with me. How do we do that? through the ordinary means of grace. There's no special secret. There's no special sauce. There's nothing we sprinkle or, or dab or dash upon ourselves. We don't carry a lucky charm or a pendant or an amulet in our pocket. The ordinary means of grace, study of God's Word, memorization of God's Word, prayer, private prayer, public prayer, corporate prayer, the sacrament, of communion. Remain in me, abide in me, come to me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain, remain in me, in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So in Christ, we have this promise of peace. We have peace in Christ. Let me just give you one brief, well-known historical example of the kind of peace that we're talking about here. One of uh, my favorite hymns, and I assume one of your favorite, is uh, the hymn by Horatio Spafford, It Is Well With My Soul. And many of you probably already know the story, but if not, it bears repeating. If you don't know it, it bears knowing. Horatio Spafford was fairly wealthy, and his wife and daughters were on a trip to uh, Europe and taking the only means of transportation available then, boat, a boat. That boat sank. There were not enough life boats. There were not enough life jackets. I don't know all the details or remember all the details, but the end of it was that his wife alone survived. His daughters died. She sent him a telegram saying, saved alone. And he knew what she meant. And in their grief, they did not despair. Because the story of the hymn is that it was written after that, as they recrossed the ocean and passed the place where their daughters were drowned. It is well with my soul. And peace like a river, right? It is well. That kind of thing would undo most of us. We love our children and we can't stand to see anything happen to them. It's why we make such a fuss over them when they fall and scrape their knee or bump their head or break a leg. It is good and right and natural for us as parents to show that love and concern for them. But what do we do in this fallen world when something terrible and tragic does happen? Do we have peace in Christ? The Bible promises that we can have peace in Him. In the midst of of reality, which is where Jesus goes next. 
He gives us this reality check of reminding his disciples that in this world you will have trouble. You'll have tribulation in this world. This world in John's gospel, the, the Greek word cosmos or cosmo is used typically in John's gospel to refer to this present evil age. It's to refer to the created world in rebellion against God's good purposes and plans for the world. It's used as, a, as an antagonist to God and the things of God, which was one of the things that makes John 3.16 so incredibly amazing. For God so loved the world. What kind of world? Not just the, the mountains, not just the forest, not just the birds or the Grand Canyon. He loved the, the sinful world. For God so loved the world that was His enemy, the world that He uh, was judging because of their sin. He so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting world. And so Jesus reminds His disciples that not only is there peace in Me, but in this world you're going to have trouble. There are problems in this world. We don't have time today for me to expound the kind of trouble we have in this world. We could all sing that wonderful song, Nobody Knows the Troubles I've Seen, because we each have our own story, and our own story includes trouble and tears. What Christians in the past have called losses and crosses. We know the reality of living in a fallen, broken, miserable, sinful world. But we don't talk about it very often. We don't talk about the trouble that we have. Why? Why not? Well, part of it is that we're trying to protect ourselves. We think if we make ourselves that vulnerable, people won't understand. People will dismiss what we say. People aren't going to be able to help us. Friends, I have news for you, good news for you. Jesus Christ knows. Jesus Christ understands. He understands the sin and the suffering of this world because He lived it. He lived in this sinful, sorrowful world. He wept tears just like you and I have. He knows what it is to suffer physically. He knows what it is to suffer emotionally. His disciples, He just said, are going to leave Him. He knows what it is to live in a world full of tribulation, and he says to us, he reminds us of this reality. In this world, you will have trouble. Why is this important? It's important not only personally for us to know that what we experience, the downs and, and, and depths of what we experience is not unusual. We're not alone. We can make it through because we have Christ with us and Christ in us and in Him we may have peace. But it's also important for us to know as a church because sometimes when we present the gospel, we don't give the full gospel. We tell them the promise of heaven, but we don't tell them the promise of persecution. We tell them that everything is going to be fine in Christ and we don't tell them that it's still going to be trouble in this world. Jesus isn't like that. He wants us to count the cost. He wants us to deny ourselves, take up our crosses, and follow Him. The gospel for Christ and the gospel for us can't just be a, a fairy tale with a happily ever ending that we wonder where it is when we hit reality. We say, man, church was great. This was wonderful. I was singing with God's people. The prayer was just, I'm so thankful, good. Praise God. We walk out, we walk back into our home and our life's a mess. We walk back into work and work's a mess. We go back and we, we don't know what to share with our coworkers or, or how to share with our family members because we say, if Christianity is true, why is there so many problems in my life, in this world? And friends, we should not be surprised. One of the things that Jesus does here is He forewarns us so that we are not disappointed in real life in this fallen world. In this world, you will have trouble. There comes a time when we won't be in this world anymore. Praise the Lord. This earth is not our home. We have a heavenly home awaiting us, and we have a, a, a Savior who has prepared a place for us. And every trial and tribulation, every loss, every cross, every sorrow, every suffering, every time that we understand the reality of the misery of this fallen world, we can be reminded that this world is not our home. 
that this is not the way it's supposed to be, that Christ is making all things right and will one day return and put all things right. And so this reality check is given to not just forewarn us, but forearm us, as it were, to say to us, don't be surprised, don't be disappointed. Instead, look to me, remain in me, and I will remain in you, because in me you may have peace. But in this world, you're going to know disappointments, pressures, persecutions. That's what this word trouble or tribulation means. It stresses. It's a word picture that the word is used typically for the pressing down of grapes to make wine, uh, juice, but then becomes wine. It's, it's used to the, for the threshing of the wheat. You know, this is, this is a heavy-duty word. This isn't talking about just hangnails or, you know, the need to get your oil changed every 3,000 miles. This is talking about death in the family or the loss of a relationship that you counted dear. This is talking about the pressure of the world pressuring you to conform, to be silent, not speak out. Pressuring you to, to agree with what they say is right instead of follow what God says is right. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. Be of good cheer. The end of this extended discourse from Jesus Christ to His disciples is take heart, be encouraged. I have overcome the world. Notice He doesn't turn to them and say, you're going to make it. Just do it. You can do it. Believe in yourself. Have a stiff upper lip. Don't let those things outside of you rock your world. He doesn't say that. He says, in me you'll have peace. In this world you'll have trouble. But be of good cheer. Take heart. I have overcome the world. That word overcome is a beautiful picture of the victory of Christ over sin, Satan, death itself. It's a beautiful reminder that our Savior is the living Savior, that the reality of Easter means that His death accomplished what He meant to accomplish, the salvation of our souls, the reconciling of us to God, the gift of eternal life. I have overcome, Jesus says. Yes, we can sing or say, you shall, we will overcome. We can, we can say that legitimately because we are in Christ. The victory is ours. We, in fact, John in his letter, chapter 5, talks about we overcome the world. How? By our faith. Jesus in Revelation talks about we who overcome. Paul in Romans 8 says we are more than conquerors because of Christ. But that's the point. It's because of Jesus. It's because of Christ. It's because of what He has done. Because of what He has accomplished. I have overcome the world. The word that is used for overcome is found in popular culture in our own day and age in a sports company called Nike. That's what this word means, victory. Triumph. So whenever you see the swoosh, think of Jesus who has triumphed over this world because we do face trouble. And one of the things that we need to be better at is sharing our troubles. One of the things that the church is to be is a family of God that bears one another's burdens. A safe place where we can share the depths of our heart, where when there is loss we come alongside of one another, and we love each other as Jesus has loved us. We will have trouble in this world. But the promise is peace in Christ. So how do you view your life? Will you view your life from the perspective of Jesus overcoming the world and remain in Him so that He remains in you? So that the peace that is unshakable is yours throughout the storms of life? Or will you continue to be tossed to and fro as so many of us are so often because we do not know the anchor 
for our souls, Jesus Christ. My prayer is that you would know Jesus Christ. That there wouldn't be only a public profession of believing in Jesus Christ, but a continued expression of that real possession of faith in Jesus by remaining in Him so that He remains in you, so that the peace that He offers will be yours in the midst of trouble. Take heart. And let us tell others to take heart too. Because Jesus has overcome the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these mighty truths. We pray that as we seek to apply them to our own lives, as we seek to have this perspective, this very different perspective on our own life and of the world, that you would help us to count the cost and know that Jesus is worth it. That as we follow him, we may be assured of trouble, of tribulation, of persecution. But Jesus is worth it. It's worth going. It's worth leaving. It's worth following Christ. Help us, please, to understand this. Help us to express this in our daily lives. Help us to remember it by the power of the Holy Spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. It is a delight now to uh, receive new members, and so I'd ask uh, Ray and... Ben and Zach and Caleb and Ethan to come forward, please. For these four young men have completed the communicants class and so are joining on their own.